Thank you very much, Cyrus, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to come and speak uh, to the meeting. Yes, as, as Cyrus says, I, I haven't quite known him as long as the 1980s when, when Chris first met Cyrus. It was the early 1990s, and, and as Cyrus said, I was involved with promoting a different package for doing uh, sequential trials um, at the time. So what I'd like to talk about today is, is quite a, a broad topic. I, I set myself the task to try and summarize to you where I think we are really with phase two, three clinical trial methodology. It's certainly been an area that's been developing over a number of years, and it has the uh, scenarios that, that Chris was talking about that essentially different authors have come up with different approaches, uh, they use different terminology, and so what I wanted to try and do was to bring some of that together and to give you an overarching view of what currently is out there. So I can start really with just uh, some acknowledgements. Uh, there are a number of people that I've worked with uh, on phase two, three clinical trials. Um, I have a, a long established connection uh, with Nigel Stallard. He and I were at Reading together as students a long time ago, and he's now at the University of Warwick uh, in the UK. Tim Frieder, who I'm sure many of you also know, he is at the University of Göttingen now in Germany, and he's been involved in this work. And then we have a number of research fellows um, who have also been doing work in the various areas. So I'd like to thank Nick Parsons, Cornelia Kuntz, and Peter Kamani. So what I'd like to do uh, in my talk today is to start by uh, just a little bit about the background. Many of you may well be familiar with phase two, three clinical trials. If not, I want to just talk about the setting and, and give a little bit of notation. Then, uh, to my knowledge, there's three general approaches for uh, combining data across the, the phases. Chris has already spoken about the combination testing approach, and that's one of them. And I'm going to just uh, bring out two other different approaches. I then want to talk about recent advances in the field of design. Uh, one of those is, is the one that Cyrus has mentioned about using early endpoints in a phase two, three setting, and then talk a little bit about estimation, uh, both point estimates and confidence intervals under the heading of analysis, and finally end with some conclusions. So we all know traditional drug development, we all know the phases of clinical trial design, so I just wanted to pick out the essential elements of phases two and three that we want to try and bring together for these combined phase two, three designs. So our, our phase two trials, the, the early endpoint trials, so they're there to assess treatment efficacy. They are most likely exploratory in nature. Often the regulators now are using the term learning and confirming stages. So the phase two trials are our learning stages. And we're often looking to select one or, or, or maybe a couple of treatments or doses for further development. And it's definitely this treatment selection element which is the one that's been incorporated into these phase two, three designs. Uh, the phase three trials, as we know, large-scale controlled trials, often the comparison of a single experimental treatment with the control, and that's where we do start worrying about error rates and being confirmatory. So phase two, three clinical trials, they do exactly what, to, what they should do. They look to combine phases two and three into a single trial. Um, these trials can be conducted in several stages. A lot of times people will talk about two-stage designs. But actually the most general framework that we can envisage is that we have a number of early stages, so one or more early stages, where the main objective is to select these promising treatments. So that could be two, three, four. It could be a number of stages that, or a number of interims that come part of this early stage. And then we have later stages where we look to compare the selected treatment or treatments with a control. And what we'd like to be able to do is to include the possibilities of stopping both for efficacy and also stopping for futility. 
So this is the very general approach. This is where we'd like to get to with phase two, three clinical trials. So it's a very general scenario. We start at the beginning, and I've put a control treatment in here, T0. We then have a number of experimental treatments. At the first interim analysis, we obviously still have our control. Then we order our experimental treatments in some sense. So my, my subscript here is just noting some sort of, of ordering. We then want to employ a suitable uh, technique to decide maybe we're stopping for superiority at this stage, maybe stopping for futility. Uh, if not stopping for either of these, then we will be making some sort of treatment selection. Um, that could be one treatment, it could be more than one treatment. We would then go into interim two, still with the control, and now with a reduced subset of treatments. So I've got less here. And we could envisage carrying on and carrying on in that very general framework, successively reducing the number of experimental treatments that we're keeping so that we're left with a small number, uh, maybe just one experimental treatment and control at the last interim, or maybe still a couple of experimental treatments. So that would be the nice, very flexible approach if we could get to that, that would give us the most ability to discriminate between treatments in a trial. But as is always the case, we like to start somewhere simple, and so most of the methodology for phase two, three trials has concentrated on two-stage designs. So uh, what we try and do within the two-stage design essentially is mirror exactly what we have in the standard traditional framework. So there's my classical framework up here, a phase two uh, learning phase with a number of treatments and a control. We then have the white space between those two phases and at the end our phase three just has a single experimental treatment and control. The, the usual two-stage design starts in exactly the same way as a phase two trial, so we have a number of experimental treatments in the control, and then we go straight into our stage two, which is the confirming stage, and most often we just go down to selecting a single experimental treatment. So we don't have this lovely sort of succession of learning about things across a number of interims. The phase two, uh, sorry, the stage two, the two-stage design simply goes down to one experimental treatment. The other thing that we have and, and has been alluded to by Chris in his first presentation is we have a, a mix of sort of short-term and long-term data that can be accruing on these patients. So I've, I've already put in here a couple of uh, sample sizes. So I've got N1 and N2, sorry, N1, capital N1 and, capital, and small N1 here, which is uh, looking at the short-term data and the long-term data are available when we select the treatment. And I've got N2 here, which is going to be looking at the long-term data at the end of the trial. So I'm going, to, I'm going to be referring a little bit to this general framework because some of the recent advances have tried to keep this very general setting. Um, and at other times, I'm going to be specifically looking at two-stage designs because the development has been easier to do in that setting. Now, in terms of uh, the, the treatment selection, there are an, a number of uh, possibilities that we can think of. We can think of situations where we have a placebo and a number of treatments which are all different doses of the same experimental treatment. So that's very often the setting that we have in these types of designs. Um, Interestingly, in this situation, there is the question of incorporating dose-response information, and can we do that as part of the phase two testing? Uh, the other situation that we may have is that we may have not only several doses of an experimental compound down here, but also more than one active treatment. So then we have a number of elements that we're interested in looking at. Neither of these designs were done as phase two, three designs, but they are examples of trials whereby you could imagine that that type of framework might be suitable. So, as I said, I wanted to start off by uh, just giving you the different approaches to conducting phase two, three clinical trials. Um, Nigel and I wrote a, a review article for Statistical uh, Methods in Medical Research in 2012, and so what's coming in the next few slides uh, is taken from that article. 
We've heard uh, a lot yesterday and also from Chris this morning about the main aim in these adaptive designs is to control our family-wise error rate and that what we're worrying about is both the selection element when we're doing these phase two, three designs and also the multiple testing element. So there are three uh, approaches that have been developed um, probably over about a 10 or, or 12 year period looking specifically at this idea of combining these two phases. So in, in, in no particular order, uh, I know I was involved in the first one and that's not really the reason why it's up the top, but uh, group sequential designs have been around as we know for a long period. And essentially, the, the element that we use of the group sequential framework for the phase two, three designs is this idea of basing inferences on cumulative test statistics. So we look at defining sufficient statistics for the selected treatments across the phase two, three setting and employ the general group sequential framework for doing our analyses. The, the second of the approaches is the one that Chris was using for his um, research, so that was the combination testing approach. So now we're looking at testing hypotheses using p-values from different stages. So that is carving your data up into different portions and then essentially combining them appropriately using some sort of uh, function. And then there is a third method which um, is known as the adaptive done it method, which is, we heard a little bit yesterday about the conditional error principle of Muller and Schaefer, and that's extending those ideas into the phase two, three setting. So I want to just take a, a couple of slides uh, just to uh, explain the, the essence of, of each of those methods. The, the main reason being is that some of the recent work has been trying to uh, bring together conclusions that are coming from both of those approaches. So what we've had now is we've got new developments under both of these areas, and we'd like to know how similar or how different they are. So the, the group sequential phase uh, two, three design, uh, so I said it's been around uh, 10 years now. So essentially just a, a little bit of notation to start off with. We've got uh, theta i, which is the measure of the superiority of the ith of our experimental treatments over control. Uh, we're testing this as our null hypothesis. So we have a null hypothesis associated with each of our uh, uh, experimental over control uh, comparisons. At the jth look, we're calculating, as I said, a cumulative test statistic, and that's based on all data up to and including look J. Um, we've, uh, Chris and I have agreed on S, which is great, so we've got, uh, we've got notation there, but I'm afraid we are in disagreement about information. Uh, mine is a V, Chris's was an I. So essentially, we're trying. We're trying to get there in terms of consolidating things. So, so my S is not specifically for survival data, but it is a, a score statistic, and it measures the, the cumulative advantage of the experimental treatment over control. Uh, v here is, is information. Maybe I should use I. It would make more sense, actually. <laughs> And then we have this assumption, again, that Chris was talking about, um, which is essentially that our score statistics are approximately normally distributed with a particular mean and variance. And what we've done for the, the phase two, three uh, situation is if you think about it, we've got these I treatments across the, the J looks. And so essentially we, what we should have is information indexed by both I and J, but we've assumed that VIJ is equal for all of our treatments. And so we're just down to the VJ that sits in here. So that wouldn't be too No, no, it makes it harder, exactly. So the, the single treatment setting, uh, let me all look back, back to 2000 again, Jenison and Turnbull 2000. So this is the, the single treatment case for group sequential designs. So we have the situation that the jth look, so now I've forgotten my eyes. I'm not talking about different treatments. This is just the single treatment case. I can calculate my SJ and VJ, my efficient score and information for theta. So there's no I on that at the moment. And we can determine stopping boundaries via something like a, a suitable spending function. So that is where East started with doing spending functions and the traditional group sequential designs. And we would stop if our test statistic is greater than the upper boundary at a particular look or if the test statistic is less than the lower boundary. 
and stop at a final look, if not before. So this is all very standard things. So what Nigel and I tried to do was to extend this very simple framework to the case of the phase two, three design, <coughs> but trying to keep it uh, fairly simple. So what we did was we kept this idea of several interim analyses. So we're not, we've not gone down to the two-stage design. We're keeping a number of interims. But what we wanted to do was at the first interim to make the treatment selection and just go down to a single experimental treatment and control at that point. So we've got the data that's available at the first interim analysis. We're going to select the single best experimental treatment. So we are, we're not allowing this lovely design that's very flexible. It does have that um, restriction. We've made the assumption here that I was talking about on the previous slide that we've got the common information. And then these SI1s for all of our different um, treatment comparisons follow a multivariate normal distribution with these properties. So what we wanted to do was obtain group sequential boundaries at the first look, which is where there is all this complication of, of the multiple treatments. You can do that by looking at the distribution of the maximum of these SI1s. So remember, we're only going to select a single best experimental treatment. We're selecting that single best treatment on the basis that it has the largest SI1. We're looking at the distribution of this maximum, and then you can use that with with a little bit of manipulation of your recursive numerical integration formulae to be able to give you a U1 and an L1 at that first look that accounts for the treatment selection. So you've got past that first hurdle, you've decided on your best treatment, you've compared it with the upper and lower boundaries, and then after that, you're down to the situation of a single experimental treatment versus control again. So you can relax. We're back to what we know. We're back to group sequential trials that we're all familiar with. So your second and subsequent looks are identical to the single treatment versus control case. And that sort of settled us down into things that we're, we're familiar with. So that was really where we started trying to think about the, the phase two, three trials in the group sequential uh, framework. Um, at around about the same time, in fact, a, a little bit earlier, um, there was the uh, ideas of combination testing that were coming to the fore. And, the, and Bauer and Kieser, back in 1999, started thinking about phase two, three designs within that combination test framework. So uh, the next couple of slides are very familiar. Chris has already talked about them, the idea of using closed testing methods together with a combination test approach to be able to draw your inferences. So the, the original combination testing approach references a, a little bit earlier. Um, essentially, we, we've seen this uh, already this morning, the idea that we have a number of elementary hypotheses that we're interested in. So I've got HI here, which are, are each of our comparisons that we want to make. This idea of defining an intersection hypothesis, which again, Chris has already talked about, and the idea about if we employ the closed testing methods and the combination test in appropriate manner, then we can control our family-wise error rate in the strong sense. So these are the various uh, ingredients, uh, again, with, just with the references that, that Chris has already talked about. So the idea of closed testing procedures was due to Marcus et al. in 1976. Uh, so rejecting uh, an individual elementary hypothesis if and only if you reject all the intersection hypotheses for which it's associated, and that controls our family-wise error rate. Um, what tends to be done in terms of these combination testing approaches is using a Dunnett test. There are other options, but uh, using a Dunnett test for testing these intersection hypotheses. Um, and then this idea that essentially what you have within a phase two, three design is you have a number of these intersection hypotheses at the first stage. You have all of these intersection hypotheses going on at the second stage, and you want some way of bringing them together. So the way of bringing them together is our combination test, which, again, we've already uh, heard about. So we have a, a p-value associated with testing a particular intersection hypothesis at a particular stage. And, and the uh, combination uh, test that I've illustrated up here is the inverse normal method. And again, this is the one that tends to be used within that combination testing framework. 
Um, there is the, the, uh, the extra sort of condition that we have at the bottom that is essentially a slightly weaker condition than independence that essentially we want these two p-values to satisfy. So the, the third of the methods uh, that people have looked at for phase two, three designs is a, is a slightly more uh, recent uh, reference, um, and that's uh, extending the, the work of Muller and Schaefer, which was uh, published back in 2001. And it's this idea that if we start uh, a phase two, three design with the stage one interim analysis uh, conducted, but no treatments dropped, and then we could propose a final analysis using a closed testing procedure and a done its test, retaining everything. Essentially, then we can use the conditional error principle, and the authors show that it's possible to redesign that second stage of the trial, allowing the treatments to be dropped and applying the done its test without inflating the type 1 error rate. So it's, that's the, the, it's the, the, the latter idea, which is essentially uh, within this paper, and it's the idea of translating it into the phase two, three setting. So I'm often asked when I, I talk about this, well, okay, you've given me three ways of doing this, which, which one should I choose? You know, there are different approaches that are out there. Um, I think it largely depends on a number of things. There's um, familiarity with the methodology for the people that you're discussing these types of approaches with. Uh, there's validity of assumptions. So you were just asking about the survival data case for the assumption that we have, and there are obviously other assumptions associated with the different approaches. Um, acceptability to the regulators obviously has to play in quite a lot there. Um, ease of implementation, um, including availability of software to be able to do these things, um, and also the statistical properties. So there are a number of, of pointers which I think are relevant. Um, essentially, the, the first one I've already highlighted, which is the, the, the original group sequential approach um, was limited to selecting the best treatment. So if you have two treatments that are very close, then it wouldn't fit within that framework as we described it. Uh, the combination test and the adaptive done-it test um, are good in terms of flexibility, in terms of the number of treatments, and, and also the possibility of ad other adaptations. So that's a, a, a tick in, in that box in order to implement them. Um, the group sequential and the adaptive done-it rely on um, asymptotically normal test statistics, which again, you need to think about whether you're comfortable with that assumption. Um, so uh, the other thing is that the group sequential tests and the combination tests extend more naturally to more than two stages, and that's less easy for the adaptive done it. So there's, there's pluses and minuses, really, for, for each of those approaches, which is why I think, essentially, nobody has, has gone down definitely on one side or another <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> because there still seems to be that most of the developments that are still happening are, are going on within the, the, the different alternative settings. So um, I wanted to, to move on from that general framework to talk a little bit about recent advances, both in the design um, and the analysis. So sticking with the, the group sequential framework uh, to start off with, um, as I highlighted, the, the main uh, criticism of that was that essentially the first interim analysis you needed to select just one experimental treatment. Um, well, Nigel and, and Tim looked to extend that, and essentially what they considered was pre-specifying the number of treatments at each analysis that you were going to take through, so, for example, we might start off with five experimental treatments and a control, and we might say at the first interim analysis we'll go down to three and a control, then we'll go down to two and a control, and then eventually to one and a control. So you've said how many you're going to do, which is the, the pre-specified number of treatments at each stage, and it needs to be pre-specified to, to protect the error rate. And then essentially they're still looking at the, the distribution of the maximum of something, but now it's a maximum of an increment at each of the stages. So if you predefine things and look at the increment, then essentially you're, you're on track to keep with that group sequential setting. That has been uh, generalised even further most recently, um, and this is work of, of Dominic McGeer and colleagues, which at the University of Lancaster uh, in the UK, and they've looked at trying to remove the restriction of fixing those number of treatments in advance. 
So that's taking this, uh, the, this, the problem that we still need to say how many we're going to keep at each stage and making that much more flexible. So that's one avenue in which this type of methodology is trying to be extended. It's in terms of making it more like that general framework for a phase two, three design. <coughs> Excuse me. Another way in which we have been thinking about trying to extend it, and that was as, as Cyrus alluded to, is the idea of trying to use early endpoint data as well as the longer term data when we're doing the treatment selection. So there are a number of, of papers that have been looked at in that area. So I did some work with Nigel again back in 2005, which was looking at treatment selection based on the short-term endpoint data by modifying this distribution. So that was what we started looking at. Um, another method which uh, Nigel developed, which was looking at basing selection on both short and long-term data that's available at the interim. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this method in a minute, but that's essentially using a double regression technique to be able to find um, a quantity that you can incorporate within this group sequential framework. The, the combination testing approach, again, people have looked at trying to extend that to make it more flexible. So um, there's been uh, quite a bit of work that's looking at Bayesian techniques for making the treatment selection, but still sticking with frequentist methods for the hypothesis testing. Uh, so there's a number of references uh, to that particular uh, uh, set of work. And the other reference, which again is under the combination testing approach, is the one that Chris mentioned, which was looking at this question of incorporating short-term data into the combination testing approach. Um, and essentially, we did exactly that, what Chris was saying. So that our sort of stage one p-value essentially is based on the long-term data only of those patients who were part of the cohort that we used the short-term data on to make the decision. So it was the, the issue that exactly that we've been discussing so far about uh, this idea of being very specific about what feeds into your different parts of the combination test. Um, I wasn't aware of anything that was done really on the adaptive done it. I don't know whether the other reference that Chris mentioned, uh, the Earl and Schaefer, would fit under the, the adaptive done it setting. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the paper, so I, yeah. Ah, okay, so Tim Frieder has done some work looking at the subgroup question as well, so that's... Then he solved the same problem that Chris did of the problem of survival data from the first cohort to the second So, so the, the, this, this technique here, we do it... Yeah, so what we do is essentially is we... As Chris was saying, you split up your two cohorts. So essentially, you have the situation whereby you use the first cohort's short-term data to make the treatment selection, but then you just use that cohort's long-term data for your stage 1 p-value. And then your stage 2 p-value is based on the other people that weren't as part of your stage 1. So it, it's, a, you know, it, it solves that problem again. So what we would like to do with this would be to estimate it based on the data. Yeah. yeah. So, so some of the work that we did, obviously, for the simulations, it was assumed known. But what we would say as part of the method was that you should try and estimate it based on the data that you've got. And then you plug it in as if it were. But, the yes. Data yeah, exactly. And work it with that. Yeah. yeah. So... To, to bring up to date with what we've been thinking about with the, the short-term um, endpoint data, we've got those two methods. So there's the, the, the Stallard method, which was developed within the group sequential framework, and then there's the, the Frieder et al. method that was developed within the combination testing approach. So uh, one of the things that one of the research fellows has been looking at is essentially to, to give a comparison of those methods to try and answer the question, which one should you use? 
So just as a quick summary, so we're here with the Stallard method. We've got the treatment selection based on the score statistics. It's a, it's a double regression. Essentially, you regress the uh, short-term endpoint on the treatment group and then the longer-term endpoint on both the treatment group and the short-term endpoint. So that's how you get your, your double regression. And you do that based on data available at the end of stage one. The treatment group with the highest test statistic is the one that's then chosen. Um, some long-term endpoint data is needed at the interim analysis, and as I say, it's within the group sequential framework. The Friedrich et al. method, the treatment selections based on standardized statistics only using the short-term data. Again, we take the treatment group with the highest test statistic. You don't incorporate long-term data in that approach in contrast to the salad approach, and it's the opposite type of, it's the combination testing. So the setting that we, we chose to, to try and compare these methods, specifically because this uh, work was in the two-stage design, so I am now simplifying things again that I've just got these two stages. So I've got a two-stage design here, and I'm now going to make that as a, as a two-stage design as well. So a little bit of, of notation. Uh, so we've got a, a, I'm sort of doing everything within the sort of normally distributed setting. So I've got short-term endpoint X, a longer-term endpoint Y, and that follows a normal distribution here. So there's my short-term and long-term endpoint, and these are the, the means that we're assuming. And we have a correlation in here, which is the correlation between the endpoints. Um, this essentially gives us the sort of fixed effects model. We can also assume that these treatment um, effects here follow a normal distribution, which would give us a random effects model. And we've now got a correlation that's built in here that's the correlation between those treatment effects. So we've got a correlation amongst treatment effects and a correlation up here between endpoints. So the... The setting that we were looking at uh, was comparing three experimental treatments with a common control. At the end of the first stage, we've got long-term endpoint data on N1 patients per group and short-term endpoint data on capital N1 patients per group. So we've got a lot more here, short-term data, and only a subset of the patients have given us the long-term data. Uh, we're focusing on experimental treatment one and assuming that that's the most effective and we can compare the methods in terms of various choices for the correlations. So first of all, uh, the type 1 error rate, if we look at those, so these are treating the methods exactly as they were described. So it's looking at the methods exactly for the Stallard approach that's the group sequential and the Friedrich et al. exactly for the combination testing approach. So uh, the Stallard approach, we're sort of, you know, it's based on simulation, so we're wobbling around the 0.025, so it's kind of a full-level test. The, the Frieda et al. method, uh, if I come back here, uh, so essentially there was this, this issue of doing the p-values that we've already talked about, and there was also what to do about p-values for treatments that are dropped when you come to putting together the, the various stages of the trial. So we took a conservative approach for that, set the test statistics to minus infinity or, or set the p-values for one. So if you're doing that, that's very conservative, and you can see that reflected in what happens here with the type 1 error rate. So the... So... That's the correlation. So, it's, so, it's, so you've got a conservative approach, and it's also a conservative approach which is dependent on the correlation. So you, you, ne you never exceed your, your 0.025, but it is dependent so on... Really yes, yeah, as you, as you get. Um, yeah. So that, remember, that, that is the, that's the correlation between the endpoints, because we've got the two sets of combinations that are in there. So the second thing that we looked at um, comparing these methods was to look at uh, selection probabilities and powers. And again, yesterday we were talking about different ways of defining all of these things. When you move into the treatment selection case, there are different ways to define uh, both the selection probability and the power. So we looked at the probability of selecting treatment one, given that we defined that one to be the best. So that was our definition for selection probability. Uh, this is only based on uh, the, the state data um, and actually you can actually write down the, the the distributions for this so it's possible to compute it for known variances and com combination sorry correlations using routines from multivariate normal uh, tail areas the power is now across both stages to define overall power 
So essentially, that is a bit more complicated. We've done it for the probability to correctly reject the null hypothesis corresponding to the most effective treatment. And the, it's computationally more complicated, so we've moved to simulations for doing that. So just a, a couple of pictures. It's, uh, they're quite uh, busy, so I just want to pull out the, the main things. So this is looking at the fixed effects case. So I'm, what I've got here is selection probabilities on the uh, vertical axes or power down here. It's for different correlations um, on the horizontal axis. We've got various, it, well, here we've got different sample sizes. So we've kept the um, reference treatment difference equal to 0 0.5. So this is the treatment difference on both the short-term and the long-term endpoint. And we've looked for various sample sizes. Here I've done the opposite. So we've kept the sample sizes the same. So this is how much long-term data we've got, how much short-term data we've got. And this is looking at different uh, possible treatment effects. Anything that's in bold is related to the Stallard method for doing things. Anything that's in the paler colour is the Frieder et al. method for doing things. Um, the Frieder et al. method, uh, the way in which it's defined, it doesn't depend on this uh, row W, so these are all straight lines here. The Stallard method has an influence relating to the correlation. But essentially what I wanted to show you is that by and large, the Frieder et al. method seems to be better. So for the pairs of lines here, the solid paler lines are above the, the solid dark lines. But it's not always the case. I mean, here out at the extremes, we've got situations where the Stallard method does a little better here. It also does a little better further across the board. And for other scenarios that I've not shown you, it's not always clear which one you should use. So that's the, the, the fixed effects uh, results. Uh, the random effects, again, as you can imagine, there are an awful lot of things that you can, can illustrate. So now with the, with the random effects, we've got this as well, which is changing, so our other correlation. But again, we can look at very similar types of plots. Uh, you, you can't see too much in here, but essentially here's one here. So the Frieda solid line here is still above the Stallard et al., but it's not always the case over here. We've got the Stallard is better than the Frieda. Up here, it's easier to see. These are the calculations, which is why they're smooth. These are the simulations, which is why there's a little bit more fluctuation in them. But there, the Stallard one is better than the Frieda. So it's certainly true to say that neither of the approaches is always better than the other method. Um, also, given that's another thing about phase two, three trials, there's so many parameters involved you know, there's so many treatment effects, there's correlations, there's when you're taking the interim looks, what you're doing. So given the number of parameters, there is no way to do, draw a specific conclusion about which of those two approaches is sensible. You're unlikely to know enough about these up front to be able to say, I'm going to do the Frieda et al, or I'm going to do the Stallard et al approach. Um, so we looked at uh, developing some sort of data-driven method to see if we could uh, try and combine both of those elements. Uh, so that's uh, just uh, under review at the moment. So the idea behind the data-driven approach, just in a single slide, is we can conduct the stage one of the trial. We can do each of these methods and see which treatment the method picks. So suppose Stallard says pick treatment one and the Frieder et al. says pick treatment two. Then we calculate selection probabilities for each of these based on the estimated parameters from the data. Um, the treatment with the highest selection probability is the one that we then go with. So that might be treatment one or it might be treatment two. And then we've put all of this into the, the combination testing approach. So, uh, so that's something that's just uh, still under review at the moment, but we think it's particularly useful when a little, only very little is known about the parameters. So just to, to end up with, I wanted to complete the set and tell you a little bit about um, recent advances that have been looked at for analysis. So, so far I've focused on design. Uh, the question of how to analyze phase two, three trials is also important. So um, the point estimates and the, the confidence intervals, that they're going to be incorrect. 
at the end of a phase two, three trial, and there's a number of references here to people that have looked at that issue. Um, there has been some work um, that's looking at in obtaining estimators with improved properties. Uh, some of these are very old, so they're not in the context of the phase two, three design, but they are in this idea of, of multiple comparisons uh, to control. So there's Cohn and Sakrovich, which was looking at uh, Rao Blackalization. The Shen was looking at stepwise, and we looked at bias-adjusted maximum likelihood estimates. Now, most of the methodology has been developed assuming we've got no stopping for superiority or stopping for futility. So again, it's this situation that we want this fantastic design that does all these things, and what we've got uh, are other methods which are quite restrictive. So recent work, um, some, there's some recent work by Carreras and Braneth that was looking at shrinkage estimation to try and, as a solution to this idea of, of selection bias, and also looking at estimation continue, uh, conditional on not stopping on futility. Um, and both of those papers include comparisons with all of these other methods that have been developed above. Uh, interval estimation, again, there's a whole host of papers that are out there looking at that um, over a, a period of time. Some of these look at doing confidence intervals for the selected treatment. Some of them look at doing confidence regions for the whole space that you're considering and then chopping it up into suitable confidence intervals. Uh, some of them look at the situation where you just take through the single best treatment. Some of them look at taking, say, a, a second best treatment because on safety grounds it's better. So there are a variety of, of, of nuances, if you like, between these different methods that have been proposed for confidence intervals. Um, so Pete has been looking at um, a comparison of these, again, with a slight restriction, the, the idea of taking the most effective treatment through, but trying to disentangle what's going on amongst those different sets of methodology. So finally, just to say a little bit about using phase two, three designs in practice, you probably know an awful lot more than I do about this, but I've certainly been to conferences where I've seen two uh, trials highlighted as being uh, phase two, three trials by design. So there's a, within the oncology area, um, there was a phase two, three design which was done using the group sequential approach, um, and that's out there in the literature, and, and Andy Stone, particularly from AstraZeneca, often talks about this at conferences. Um, and then within the chronic disease setting, uh, Novartis have conducted a phase two, three design. That's within the combination testing uh, framework. And, and that, again, Frank Bretz and others have presented at conferences. Um, what I'm hearing when I go now and, and, and talk to people is not so much about the methodology, but about the challenges of putting these methods into practice, particularly the issue of, of DSMBs and who should be responsible for the actual treatment selection decision, whether you give it over to a DSMB, do you define rules that they ought to follow, how many people should be involved in that treatment selection uh, stage of things. Um, so certainly there are a lot of challenges surrounding putting these into practice. Um, another thing I'm aware of is increasing implementation in the public sector, but they have different challenges to follow in terms of, of certainly their funding framework is very different from the pharmaceutical companies. So um, certainly it's true to say that research continues. There's a lot of open questions on phase two, three designs. Um, it is receiving funding, so uh, several of the research councils in the UK are certainly interested in, in this type of methodology. Uh, regulators are still uh, prepared to think about it, so there's often um, workshops and meetings and working groups looking at phase two, three designs. Um, they have been uh, used, as I've said, effectively in a couple of uh, clinical research areas, but I think their uptake will only really continue if more and more people are wanting to, to try it out. Um, and as I say, really to bring the phase two, three methodology to practice, I think it needs a lot of work, both on the techniques and the practical challenges and the software. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. That, that really was an, an excellent uh, overview of uh, all the recent uh, developments in, in this area. I had uh, two questions. Uh, one was, I was a little uh, confused about, uh, in one slide you showed that the 
that the type one error was always uh, lower for the um, for the no the Stollard method the had, Stollard, had, yes. had, had, had was closer to the alpha level. Uh, and yeah. this yes, yeah. and this one is and conservative. So, and, and yet, uh, when it came to power, it it was reversed. Yeah, I was going to say it's, I, it's, I, it's I, the opposite. Why, why that would be. Um, I'm yeah, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember whether uh, wh which ones were done under the fixed effects and which ones were done under the random effects, because obviously there's also the relationship that goes on between the row W and the row B, and I'm trying to remember looking at that slide exactly which one it came from but there is there is certainly a link between those two sets of the correlation which has an impact on things so i mean it, it from this it looks like the stolid method should be better in power as well right but it, 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 I say it isn't when it comes across to those other ones. I think it i think it's also within the setting of because there are the two different approaches for doing it as well my other question was about uh, you know, all, it's not really necessary. Uh, well, one, one reason why I think the Stollard method should be better is you actually are know, you know the correlation from stage to stage. You did it, yes. And, uh, you know, whereas in, in the other one, it's sort of much more uh, close testing, uh, which that is an advantage of. Because you've got, well, essentially you've got, you mean because you've got the short term and the long term data. In the Stallard but, method, but I mean, even in general, and then in the in general, if you just had treatment selection, just just for the treatment selection problem, mm -hmm. you know, you have uh, three treatments and a control, and you use a, a group a group success method, and all, got all the, the time, yeah. I mean, it must be more efficient to use the full. It must be. It cannot be better. To voluntarily to just I'm use that on the, the long term endpoint if I already have it on somebody. I think it depends of you yeah, it depends on what because there's the, the the freedom method has essentially it depends on it depends on your your N one and it depends on your mu for your small b. <laughs> so that's what you've got in there. The Stallard method has a lot more that it depends on, and there are interactions that go on between those various parameters that essentially mean that it's one point that I didn't fully follow. Mm. So you're, you are assuming, can you go back to the slide with your multivariate normal distribution? Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so your short, you are not assuming that your long-term endpoint is something like there is no drift in the means. Is that correct? So it's not like I'm looking at my endpoint after three months. And then I'm looking at the same endpoint no. after six months, no. and I know that there is some time trend in the means. No, so, so, so these things are unrelated. So the assumptions that you are making about these things also has an impact on your power. So it's actually not only the correlation that is important here, but actually it's also important what are the real means yeah. for your short-term and your long-term endpoint. So essentially what we were envisaging, as you say, is something like, um, I don't know, uh, multiple sclerosis where you've got uh, your short-term endpoint is some uh, MRI data which is normally distributed and then your long-term endpoint is something like the EDSS scale. Um, so essentially you've, you've not got, it's not a, an early endpoint available at three months and then another, you know, the same that, endpoint at so six months. That so means that even if you have a high correlation between the endpoints, but for example when it comes to treatment, it, selection in terms of the means that you are assuming the the early readout but are close together but the others are far apart, apart that also impacts the power quite yes. a bit yeah. maybe and more than the correlation the yes yeah okay, okay. Yeah. any other questions Is it necess it's not necessary that you have to always choose the, uh, the best treatment, uh, is it? I mean, if, if you're uh, always looking at the distribution of the max, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a multi-stage uh, setting and just, just getting the uh, uh, stopping boundaries based on the maximum of uh, you know, treatment 
and then two and so on. Uh, then, then if you if if you choose the, the the reason for choosing the max is that if you always take the the best treatment, your type one error will be protected. So so if you if you choose the if you if you use clinical judgment in, in uh, conjunction with, with the best uh, and you maybe sometimes take the second best treatment yeah. or the third best treatment you you'll still be protected conservatively yes, yes. so it's yeah. not, so if it's for, for a safety for a safety general, consideration yeah exactly if so there's a safety it, consideration it's not it's as though you have to take the best treatment. no i was I, I think i was emphasizing that that was the way in which it was set up in terms of the methodology was was looking at it as uh, taking the most effective one through but you're right you can take through the second the second best if its safety profile looks better than the, than the one which is in terms of efficacy theoretically the best but in this in this setup, uh, once you uh, once you've made a, a decision to uh, you can't con you, once you once you've chosen a treatment, you you can't continue any further. It, there's only one treatment. Is, there only, is it is it the case that you end up with only only one treatment being statistically significant? Uh, or you, you can so end up you mean do you always go down to one treatment at the end of each of these? Uh, no, at, at the end of the trial, do, do, you, uh, um, do you come up with uh, more than one? Treatment? I'm not sure about the. I mean, certainly the um, the the one I'm not sure about because it's been a while since I oh, uh, looked at it is I'm not sure on this one whether it restricts down to one at the end. I'm not sure if they've kept it more flexible. I can't remember. I, I, it's a while since I looked. Yes, that's one. And I think that's. And it says. Later questions. There's one of the Magia papers where the trial stops as soon as one treatment crosses an upper boundary. And one question that I have then is are you actually necessarily. Um, Keen to find just one. Yes, I don't. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think that's that one. I think okay. this is the one that essentially takes the this idea of the pre, removes the pre-specification, which is the is which is part of this manuscript. But I mean, let, let me ask that question. Are you are you always thinking that if you can get one treatment and show that it's superior to control, that's that's the goal? I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's a question for the audience to some extent. And I mean, is it advantageous to have two versions of a treatment that you can. I don't license? think you would necessarily go to market with two versions of a treatment. You would want one, I guess. Well, I don't know. I have a different question, though. <laughs> so you see, you're wanting this very flexible design to be even more flexible. We're working yes, on it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, but if you could go back to your slide uh, 23. Um, let's see if I'm talking. Yes, this one. This is, uh, okay, so this is, uh, we're talking about the correlation between the two endpoints. Now, where where I am still struggling is you look at your distribution, which depends on uh, rho. Um, you make the assumption, we make the assumption, that we can actually estimate rho between the two endpoints. Thus, the scale of measurement of those two endpoints needs to be similar. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you can't do that. My question is, what do we do? How do we borrow this concept, which is wonderful, to talk about biomarker. I was going to say, because you've got something, yeah. Adaptive. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. I'm yeah, no, 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 I know. And, and certainly, as you say, other types of endpoints as well. Yeah. So, ex exactly. Because this is all within the setting of the normally distributed data. So, no, it's a good question. <laughs> have There's something that's going on in terms of a relation. Thank you. I just pick up something you just said. You, you said correlation or surrogacy, but the 
The yeah, the two different, as you say, it's two different things that we've Starlet never... The method is, is using the short-term endpoint to help predict the long-term endpoint in an individual patient, isn't because it? Because that's that double regression idea. Yeah. Because you're ultimately interested in the long-term endpoint, because that's what the we The short-term endpoint could actually be, any, it doesn't have to be an interesting endpoint at all, as long as it's correlated. That's, but which is that's essentially, you, you can do this, you can yeah. get negatively correlated yeah, things. Yeah, it's just as good. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. The freedom method is doing exactly the opposite, is that right? It's, uh, it really is using the short-term endpoint as a surrogate because it's making its decision... Uh, not, it's not in terms of a surrogate or anything, because it's still only based on the long... Everything, all the inferences are based on the long-term no, data. No, but the, uh, the adaptation or the selection... The, s the selection's based on the short-term, but you could, you could make oh. the selection based on a number of, of things. Yeah, but so if you things make selection pay. based on something that's got... For, for which the mean has got no relation to the mean of the long-term endpoint, you're going to choose a ridiculously <laughs> long... You know, so so yeah. your, correlation, your other correlation... Mm in the random effects model is, is the sort of thing that the freedom method relies yes. crucially on. And I think, I mean, Cyrus asked a question earlier of, of me, you know, how do you know your short-term endpoint's actually a good surrogate? Um, and that may well be a reason that um, you know, some phase three trials don't work out very well because all the phase two decisions were based, based, based on, on a short-term endpoint. Which, yes. uh, yeah. And you know, if you actually want to prove something's a surrogate, that's an amazingly strict mm -hmm. procedure. So. For internal yes, decision indeed. making, you don't have to jump through the same hoops, but maybe one should try and do it a bit more sometimes because mm. might be getting into difficult uh, <laughs> territory by in, in indeed know, using any of those. Yes. Okay. So thank you again, Sue. <laughs>